I think that software testing is one of several places where we are often too equivocal in software. Too accepting of approaches that, as far as I can see, simply don't work very well. So what are the five types of testing that are important, maybe even essential, to the development of great software? And where and how should we use them? Oh, and what are the common mistakes that organisations make in trying to do a better job of all of this? That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe and if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. There are several ways of categorising testing in software and we all know and use the words. But I think it's important to focus on what it is that we're aiming to achieve when we adopt one form of test or another. Because these categories only matter in the context of how they are meant to help us to do a better job. Let's start with the fundamentals. Any form of testing is really a form of measurement. We evaluate the thing of interest in our system under test based on some criteria for success and measure it against that criteria. If it meets the criteria, it passes the test. If it doesn't, it fails. Software is not unique in this respect, but as usual, by its nature, it has some extra complexities. If you asked a carpenter or a metal worker which tool they would use to measure what in their work, they'd have very specific tools in mind for each task and would be very clear in their answers usually. In software, we often tend to be a bit more vague, a bit more confused in our terminology and often in our choice of tools. My aim with this episode is to take my shot at making that idea of which testing tools we should use for which task a little bit more explicit. To try to define more precisely what each of these types of test, each of these tools is really for, because each serves a different purpose. Let's start with unit testing. In Brian Marrick's four quadrant model, unit tests are technology facing team supporting tests. Fundamentally, they answer a key question for developers. Does my code do what I think it does? What we really need from these tests is fast feedback and high confidence. We need them to fail fast and give us results in a few minutes. And once we have that result, it should give us enough confidence if the test passes that everything else will be fine, that we're safe enough to proceed to working on the next new thing, whatever that might be. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, Topple, and Honeycomb. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here every week and using those techniques to help build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Topple builds software to make pair programming easier for people who work remotely. And Honeycomb help engineering teams deeply understand their own production systems through observability. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, do click on the links in the description below and check them out. These unit tests are our main defensive line. They are the most thorough, most detailed tests of our system, but they're also particularly valuable since they're computationally efficient, the most computationally efficient form of test. So we can and should have lots of them and still be able to get the results very quickly. We want to run the minimum amount of code to get the answer, does my code does what it's meant to do, but we want to do that for pretty much every piece of code. This matters because studies of software failure in production found that 58% of production defects are caused by simple programming errors, the kinds of mistakes that we all make in code all of the time. These are eliminated with simple testing, that the code does the right things. Nearly 60% fewer bugs. That's a huge investment in quality right from the start. And then there are the additional benefits to the quality of the design of our system. These tests are best generated as the outcome of test-driven development, where we write the test first and drive the design of our code from that test. 
This results in more testable code, inevitably. And the result of that is code that's easier to change. The biggest mistake with tests like these is to write them after you've written the code. This may seem like a more natural thing to do, but it's a big mistake because it doesn't lead to more testable and so better designed code. Instead, it nearly always ends up with more tactical, more complex tests that are too tightly coupled to the implementation that they're trying to test, and so don't make the code easier to change. Use test-driven development all the time. Adopt the default of writing a test for every change that you want to make to the code. Write the test first and make it focused on what the code is meant to achieve rather than how the code actually works. This will lead you to tests that make change easier instead of harder. The next type of interesting test is acceptance testing. I don't think that acceptance tests, as we talk about them in the context of continuous delivery, really fit very cleanly into Brian Merrick's model. They are functional tests, which most versions of the model place here. But they're also decidedly business facing and supporting the product. So they cover the whole top line but also some of the bottom. In fact, I think that they work better than most of the categories in this diagram on the top line because they replace nearly all of these other types of tests with one test that we can more easily integrate into our development process. The job of an acceptance test is to answer the question, is my code releasable? And to my way of thinking in continuous delivery terms, this may include any form of test that adds to our confidence to release performance testing, resilience testing, functional testing, migration testing, confirming regulatory compliance, and so on. But the vast majority of these tests will be written as executable specifications that define what the code is meant to achieve from a user's perspective. These are the classic BDD style acceptance tests. Acceptance tests work best when written, once again, before we write the code. The first act when starting work on a new feature should be to identify one or more examples that demonstrate the existing of that feature that we're adding and then create an executable specification, a test that demonstrates that example and that it works. This is most effective when treated as a normal everyday part of developing new features and most valuable of all if we adopt this discipline from the start of any new project. But Given the technical nature of these tests, it's also true that they're the easiest type of test to ret retrofit to existing code. Much easier than trying to retrofit unit tests, for example. Because acceptance tests are black box tests that interact with the system under test, usually only via its public interfaces. So they're also a great tool for stabilizing legacy systems and starting the process of upping your game in software engineering. Acceptance tests work best when written first because once again, they apply a subtle pressure on us to design more testable systems. I recommend adopting a four layer model for acceptance testing. And as part of this four layer approach, create a reusable domain specific language in which we can quickly and easily encode test scenarios. Tests like these work best when they don't refer at all to any implementation detail. No mention of forms, edit fields, pages or buttons, no mention of API calls. All of these are implementation detail and to be avoided in the specifications themselves. What this gives us is a crystal clear focus on the problem that we're aiming to solve with a clear separation between that and how we should solve it. This is enormously valuable. It means that the test cases are always right, even when failing as a result of changes to the system, for example because they only specify what the system is meant to do. It means that the development team have a strengthened, more concrete specification of what really matters, what the software is meant to achieve. They have this alongside more freedom to innovate in their solution because whatever works to achieve the goal should make the test pass. I describe unit testing and acceptance testing in combination as being at the very heart, essential parts of my recommended testing strategy. When we take this approach, we drive the whole development process from these tests. They are the genuine specification of our system. The most common mistakes in acceptance testing are usually about trying to optimize things in the wrong places. The first common mistake is to make acceptance tests that confuse what we want the system to achieve with how it achieves it. 
like this. The next common failure is to prefer acceptance tests for all testing because they're easy to write. The problem with that is that acceptance tests are meant to evaluate independently deployable units of software deployed into a production-like test environment. So these tests are expensive in terms of time to run and the resources to execute them. Don't use acceptance tests to evaluate detailed nuances of behavior, like all of the different quirks of input validation, for example. Much better to find a way to unit test those fine-grained detailed behaviors. Acceptance testing works best when it's used as a confirmation that the pieces of the system work together to achieve the goal specified in the test. They work best as a complement to unit testing, not as a replacement for it. I think that part of the reason that development teams fall into the trap of only acceptance testing is because developers are often thinking of testing as being somebody else's job. And this is another common mistake. Testing works best when it's treated as a fundamental and integral part of the development process itself, not coming as some afterthought. As W. Edwards Deming famously said, you can't inspect quality into a product, you must build it in. And in software, test-driven development is the best way for us to build it in. You should use acceptance tests to initiate and validate the development of new features and to stabilize legacy systems. I recommend taking a hard line on this in the form of replacing all manual regression testing with automated acceptance testing. If you'd like to improve your testing approach for you and your team, I have a range of online training programs that combine self-study with live workshops and offer big discounts for team bookings. Do click on the links in the description below and check them out. The next interesting test type are integration tests. Integration tests are commonly defined as part of the testing pyramid a model intended to represent the distribution of tests in a good testing strategy. I confess to disliking this testing pyramid quite a lot, and specifically in this respect, integration tests. To my mind, these are purely tactical. We add them to solve a specific kind of problem. They aren't by default needed for every feature other than in the form of acceptance tests. If we have good working acceptance tests, then these are also full-blown functional integration tests. So this is a definitional problem. Are acceptance tests, integration tests, functional tests, or something else? Yes, they're all of these things, and a bit more. They will confirm that every feature works as it should when the system is deployed and configured as it will be in production. So what do integration tests add to that? Well, nothing at all. Our acceptance tests fulfill the purpose of a kind of super integration test. So the role of integration test is distinct from acceptance tests. It's only there to allow us to fail faster. If we have a common cause of failure that too often trips up our more expensive acceptance tests, then it might be useful to find a smaller, simpler form of lighter weight integration test that will fail sooner. We can run that as part of the fast cycle the commit stage of our deployment pipeline and so allow us to fail faster. So we don't need any extra integration tests by default because we have all our features covered by acceptance tests. This points out the commonest mistake, writing integration tests instead of doing a good job of acceptance testing. The next interesting type of test are approval tests. These are another very useful, but to my mind, tactical form of tests that is context dependent. Approval tests validate that the code produces exactly the same result each time you run it. They do this by running in two modes. The first is a kind of benchmark run where the test records the results of some interaction with the system under test. And from then on, subsequent runs of the test run in the other mode. They interact with the system under test in exactly the same way, and then they compare the results from this run with the results from the benchmark run. If there's a difference, the test fails. If not, it passes. This is fantastic as an easy way to stabilize code, and is particularly valuable for code that we don't understand very well, to allow us to refactor it safely. Check out my free refactoring tutorial as an example of the use of this approach. So approval tests are a particularly excellent tool for working with legacy code. The limitation is that these tests only verify that the code does what the code does. So I see it as less useful for new development. 
Acceptance tests specify what we want the code to do. Approval tests verify that the code does the same as it did last time. So we can use acceptance tests to predict what we'd like the code to do before the code can actually do it. But we can't really do that with approval tests. The other place where approval tests are particularly useful though is in evaluating the look of a user interface. We can snapshot the UI when we're happy with it and then use approval tests to confirm that new versions of the system match the UI snapshot. There are build tools that can help with this. The final type of testing that might be interesting is manual testing. Manual testing has its place, but it's a very poor form of regression testing. People are not good at repeated detailed technical tasks. Machines are much better at that type of thing. So why don't we use the machines in the form of automated tests for all of the regression testing? Humans are better at exploration and the fuzzier kind of problem solving. So the best role for manual testing is exploratory testing, focused on testing the brand new features as they are developed and looking at the overall usability of the system, for example, rather than looking for defects in old code. The automated tests can more easily, more quickly and more thoroughly do. The commonest mistakes in manual testing is obvious. It's using humans for regression testing. It's too slow, too expensive and too low quality compared to good automated testing. So there are my five test types. I hope it's clear that I think that the best strategy is built on acceptance testing supplemented with thorough unit testing based on test driven development. The other forms of tests are best used tactically to supplement this test strategy core. You may think that there are some very obvious omissions from my list, things like security testing, performance testing, resilience testing, and so on. My argument is that these are all specialized forms of acceptance test. We create specifications to test that the code does what it must do to be considered releasable. If the releasability of our system is determined by how secure it is or how fast it is, we assert those things through acceptance tests. And most of my advice for acceptance testing holds for these other forms of testing too. In particular, working hard to separate the goal from how it is achieved. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks also to our patrons who support this channel and get lots of added value from being part of the Patreon community. If you're interested in doing that, why not check out the description in the links below. Thank you and bye-bye.